for um, the meeting, then people who come in late can still catch up and check your recording out later if they need to, right? Yeah. Okay. So um, Grant, we just, we have a few questions prepared. Um, and then as we're going through, um, club members are gonna put questions down and um, we'll just ask some questions from them at the end, if, they, if that's fine. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so um, one of the big questions, I, I think I already asked you a bit, but um, for the rest of their sake, um, what other games have you worked on like besides Megalith? Um, you know? Yeah. So um, <clears throat> I've had the opportunity to work on a lot of games. Uh, I, I won't be able to rattle them all off my head. Um, a lot of that was due to the nature of work we did at Disruptive. Um, we did a lot of client work. Um, and essentially what we would typically do was we would take off, uh, you know, like bite off a chunk of the multiplayer systems on a title. Um, that was kind of our bread and butter. Uh, we're really strong on our network engineering side. Um, so Activision would come to us and say, hey, we have X title. Can you guys handle the, you know, the multiplayer networking side? Uh, I've worked on, uh, we just, we just uh, released a week or two ago, uh, the new Tony, the Tony Hawk 1 and 2 remaster. Oh, um, nice. I worked on, uh, uh, and am working on Godfall, which is a PS5 exclusive. Uh, Megalith, which was our internal IP, Bloodstained, uh, The Grand Tour, Sniper Ghost Warrior 3, Tony 5, Evolve, uh, and just a bunch of other, uh, a bunch of other things. I, I guess I could look them up, but, uh, yeah, that's, that's okay. the ones I can think of off the top of my head. I mean, that's, that's still a big list right there. Um. Yeah, I recognized um, the Tony Hawk one. I think I saw on Steam the other day. But yeah, um, yeah. So, so Megalith is a, a VR game, right? Yeah. So, um, is there um, any unique challenges or mindsets like for doing that, or like different platforms? I should say, because I know you've also worked on VR in PlayStation, right? Yeah, Me uh, Megalith was a PlayStation um, title. Uh, it, it had an exclusivity w with Sony. Uh, at the time we signed the deal, Sony was um, about to launch their VR hardware and they needed software for their platform. Um, so at the time too, we were a small team. I think there was five, maybe six of us. Um, we grew over the, the course of production on Megalith, but um, as far as um, special cases or, or different mindset going into VR, absolutely. It's a, uh, it's a whole new beast. So we, we were getting hit on a, a few sides there. Not only did we have uh, VR, um, and there was a lot to take into account there, we were on a brand new platform. Um, and we, um, I think one of the big ones thinking back, um, so just like any title, Sony has what's called TRCs or technical requirement checklists. Um, and with their VR titles, they have a totally different group called VRC. Um, and your title has to go through and pass both of those checks um, multiple times. And one of the big checks on the VRC side was we were uh, never supposed to, they gave us some delta that we could, but it was a very, very minor amount, drop below 60 frames per second ever. Um, that was like an instant fail. Um, and given the nature of Megalith, it was a multiplayer shooter, a lot of spells going on. There was destructible environments and all this stuff that we had to replicate. We had to make it look beautiful. We, and then we had to make it perform it. Um, and so um, a large, large, um, portion of that project was just problem solving. Um, and, and I think, you know, most every project that's basically your day in, day out is problem solving. Um, there's times when you don't, um, but uh, a big part of that is uh, of game development in general is problem solving for sure. Um, and so if you're not into problem solving, you might not be into game development. 
that's pretty cool. Um, so like you've done VR development for a few years. Um, what do you think there is to look forward to for people who haven't per se um, went along that route yet? Or um, like what changes does it really have? Yeah, I, I mean, so there's, in my opinion, there's a lot of cases um, where VR is, does really, really well. Um, and it can be a really um, engaging experience. Um, and then there's other, other, you know, genres that don't work as well in VR. But for instance, uh, my wife who doesn't like video, I don't, she, she doesn't care for video games, you know, never plays them, doesn't, you know. Um, when we got the VR headset, I put her in um, a shark, it was like a shark tank cage thing. Um, and when she was going down, the shark attacks the cage, right? And um, she had this physical, visceral response to that. Um, her hands were like completely soaking wet. She was stressed. Her heart rate was super high. Um, and so you, you get those type of, um, uh, you know, uh, experiences in VR and it can be really powerful. Um, but the, the limitation right now, I think is cost. It's very big and clunky. There's a lot of wires. And so it, it's, it's a very niche market for sure right now. Um, there's some titles that do really well, like your beat sabers and maybe some job simulators, some near field stuff works really, really well. Um, but I, I think it's going to be a while before it's a mainstream thing. And there's a few hardware hurdles that need to be, um, you know, tackled there um, and, and some other stuff. But it's definitely a fun, challenging environment to, to develop in for sure. Um, and it was enjoyable for us, uh, not only on the engineering side, but the art side as well. Um, so, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so VR is sometimes... Um not something uh, early developers get into. So um, what did maybe you do when you started your development cycle? Like how did you get into the, the industry? Me personally? Yeah. So, um, well, I, and if I'm going too long or anything, feel free to cut me off or direct me in any way. It's not gonna bother me or upset me. Um, don't let me, because I can tend to talk. Um, but- that's, um, that's fine, that's why we're here. <laughs> okay. Just yeah. listen. I, I, uh, um, so I was doing essentially um, project management um, for the Navy. Um, and I was getting transferred around a lot um, for that. And I did what was called BRAC contracts. And it's basically base restoration contracts. When a Navy base shuts down, their goal is to turn it over to the city. And so I would kind of manage those projects. Um, and in, I want to say, I think it was around 2010, somewhere around there, I got transferred to the Bay Area. And... I had always, uh, always, always loved video games. And I knew that this area was kind of the mecca for uh, game development. And so I got really excited and I happened to wind up in Novato. Um, and I knew that 2K was right there in Novato and I had seen it. And so I kind of got excited about that. And uh, I remember I was driving to work. I had um, my oldest daughter at the time was maybe seven and I had a brand new baby. And I was driving, um, driving to work at like 5 a.m. And uh, I just realized I, I had a good job, but I hated it. I hated it. Um, and I was working long hours. And so I decided to go back to school and finish my degree, which took me several years to do um, with full-time job. I worked two jobs at the time. And uh, so I went back and got my degree. And then I started at, um, uh, as a QA uh, a QA tester at 2K in Novato. Good degree. Uh, and, uh, and that's um, where I like really got to see the, the, the game dev environment and how it works. Um, and then through uh, school, I had to do an internship and I looked on game dev map at the time. I don't know if anybody's familiar with that. Um, and it kind of shows you all the game developers in the area. I don't know if it's still up to date or if it's still around, but uh, I was looking for what I was looking for was a small studio because I, I had seen how a large studio like 2k operates. It's very specialized, you know, um, and I wanted to get kind of the broader picture because I still wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do. 
Um, and I found a small uh, indie studio in Berkeley called Disruptive Games. Uh, I applied for an internship there and I got it. And, uh, and then I've been there ever since. I worked as an engine, uh, intern for, I did my internship and then I stayed on after part-time. They didn't want me to leave and I said, no, nah, I don't know. And uh, I stayed on part-time and, uh, and then I eventually went on full-time as a producer. Uh, and then I was a producer all the way up until February of this year. And uh, my role has kind of shifted a bit um, at Disruptive. I still work the production side, but I'm doing more of an operations kind of um, executive producer type stuff. So, um, you know, normally as a producer, I was doing task tracking, sitting in on meetings, uh, dev kit setup, all that kind of stuff. Um, and now I handle um, more of like the bids, budgets on projects, pitch decks, accounting, bookkeeping, payroll, burn charts, all that kind of stuff. Um, I still dabble uh, in JIRA and, you know, the project management side, normally for project setup to help with that and kind of structure that stuff. Um, but we have an associate producer now that does that day to day, those scrums, those stand ups and all that kind of stuff. So it's like a really long version of uh, where I came from and where I'm at. Okay. So, so um, um, if I could jump I in real quick, if yeah. anyone ever has like questions, just feel free to type them in the chat and I'll read them out. Um, adding on to that though, uh, there was a question from James. Um, well, I was talking about project management, but I think you just kind of answered that. And, uh, but then he also added, what is your favorite project management tool? Yes. Okay. <laughs> So everybody hates Jira and it's, um, but it's an industry standard. It's a really robust tool. And I, I don't know if um, you guys have any sort of project management classes or any sort of thing in the program. I really hope you do. do, do is that, do you guys do anything like that? Um, for the business majors, at least. Okay. Uh, our, our like structures a little bit more on the agile side so i guess it's close to jira <laughs> i'm yeah, not familiar sure. with jira though so um i can tell you i would say uh, seven of the last 10 studios i've worked with have used jira and confluence so it's pretty industry standard um and it's it's um, it's going to be something that you want to know and understand. Even if you go to a studio that doesn't use it, just having it on your resume or being able to say, if you're sitting in on an interview and they say, what's your project management experience? Have you used JIRA, Confluence, all that? If you could say, oh yeah, yeah, I'm familiar with that. That's a, that's a big thing because it's a big, big part of your day. Um, it doesn't matter if you're a designer, an engineer, whatever you are, you're in JIRA. Um, or some other task tracking software, uh, project management software. Um, so just to be clear, JIRA is basically your, your task tracking system. Um, Confluence is an addition to JIRA and it's basically like your wiki and it stays live and it's kind of integrated with the tasks and you can just kind of seamlessly update docs because it's very important during production and pre-production that documents and especially designed to documents or whatever, those are archived and living as well. So that if somebody new comes in that's onboarded or somebody says, why do I have this task? And why is design telling me, hey, we don't need the whip anymore, we need a shield. You can just click on that and go look in the confluence and look through the design doc and see exactly how they came to that conclusion or understand. So it's, it's kind of this repository of information, um, but, yeah, just having a basic knowledge of some sort of project management software. Like I said, Jira is very common in the game industry. Um, but understanding like uh, Agile or, you know, any sort of um, methodologies like that, just having a, a very basic understanding of that stuff is going to be super helpful. I really like to see it on applications that come in. Um, if I don't see any sort of project management experience, it's almost a guarantee that I, that you haven't been in the industry or you're just trying to get in, um, which is fine. We, we hire um, people right out of school all the time and we have really, really good luck with that. Um, 
but we do put them, especially the engineers, um, through a test. We send out a test, which is also pretty common because uh, as you can imagine, we get a lot of applications um, and we kind of vet those applications. And if somebody looks like they have some promise or that we would be interested in, we're gonna send out a test. Um, and our test is kind of like a, it's a basic knowledge test. Of we're basically looking for your problem solving abilities and how you might go about solving some of these problems that we um, ask you to do. So um, be prepared to do a test like that uh, because it's, it's, it's really hard for us to um, decipher, you know, and look through literally hundreds and hundreds of applications um, we're a very small studio in Berkeley. We just posted a, uh, we were looking for a senior engineer. Uh, and I personally sorted through, I want to say it was close to 400 applications for that, that we got in a two week period. So um, it's important that those applications just kind of stand out and do your best, uh, you know, to, to put those things like if I, like I just said, if I see little, little, little uh, things will ping me like JIRA or Confluence or project management, all that kind of stuff, it will be super, uh, super helpful um, for, for me um, to decipher uh, those things. Okay. Um, I think that was pretty useful information right there. Um, uh, before we get to more questions on the, in the chat, uh, another question we had ahead of time was, um, Sort of, you're already talking about producers, but um, what do you aim to do as a producer? Like, what? how do you shape your goals and work with the rest of the team? Yeah, so um, it, it really depends on, um, you know, what the project is and, and what our goals are in that project, obviously. But essentially, as a producer, my job is to make sure that everybody has what they need to do their job. Um, they have all the resources they need, that everybody's communicating, and, and that there's any sort of dependencies or, you know, task dependencies or anything like that is being monitored and handled. Um, and uh, uh, a big part of my job is, um, I guess, some sort of, like, basic... Uh, I don't know how I would put it, but um, I'm able to, to uh, you know, push people to, to understand maybe why, why a task isn't done or whatever without, without being, you know, condescending or anything like that. So um, typically a producer is going to be really good at talking to people and interacting with people and, and, and keeping people at ease. Um, uh, but but it is, it is the producer's job to make sure that things are getting delivered on time. Um, a producer, a good producer is going to do a lot of legwork on the schedule and um, the, the, the milestones and the sprints. And, and you know, oftentimes if one little thing gets pushed, that, that stress can start to build up and uh, producers can get a little angsty sometimes. Um, but, uh, you know, as long as the producer does the correct work in the beginning, um, it shouldn't be a problem. Um, and, and also with time uh, comes, you know, accurate tests, uh, task estimations and stuff. I think it's, it's really good for you or any engineer. I don't know if everyone's an engineering major or, or programmers or whatever, but um, when you're doing tasks, like let's say you're working in a group project and you get a task, try to estimate that task before you do it. Like how much time is this going to take me? And just write it down, two days, three days, whatever it is. And then complete that task and see how accurate you are. Because when you get a real task and a real job, you're going to be asked to estimate it. They're, uh, they're going to want to know how long is this going to take you. And for, for newcomers, that can be, you know, that can be really, really hard. Um, but, but you're going to be asked to do it. And if you just have a basic idea of stuff uh, on, you know, how quickly you can get through certain problems and, and just estimating that, it's good to practice it right now because you're going to be asked to do that um, for sure in a professional environment. Cool. Um, 
Another question um, we had prepared. Um, so how do you set the scope for projects or like when do you need to decide to change that scope? Like what are some indicators that the scope is too big or small? Yeah, so this is, uh, this is a big one. Um, again, uh, you, you have to do a lot of legwork and understanding. Um, so, so what I'll typically do, let's just give an example here. Um, let's say we, we have a prototype and we're gonna have players swinging from trees, right? And so I know that we're gonna have rope physics, we need trees, uh, we need a player character, a character controller, whatever, some art stuff in there. So I'm going to go through and do my best to, as a producer, all the things I believe, all the tasks that are needed to complete those, those feature sets, I'm going to break those out. And then I take that to the leads, like the lead engineer, the lead artist, and I say, look at this. Did I miss anything here? Um, and then they'll, they'll review it. Um, so it's basically like a collaborative thing. But as far as when you're out of scope, um, you'll know it hopefully early. It, so that, that's what good Gantt charts, waterfall charts. Um, uh, um, I wish I could show you. Uh, can I share a screen? Uh, you should have co-host privilege. So yeah. Let me, uh, let me make sure. Give me just a second. I'm going to show you, uh, Some old, old, okay, let me see, share screen, all right. I will say in the meantime, we do have like producers on our teams, so I'm sure this information is like extremely helpful to them as well. Oh, good, all right, can everyone see this or? Uh, no, I don't think so. One participant can share at a time. Share screen, screen one. Oh wait, maybe I didn't click it. See this? Yes. Okay, so the way this was broken down, this is super old. I don't think this was ever used. This is years and years old. Um, but the goal here, so if we look up at the top, uh, let's let's just start here, milestone 13. So we had content update, milestone 13. This is broken down by uh, weeks. Sprint one, we had two week sprints, right? Sprint one, sprint two. Two sprints per milestone in this one. Then we moved to three sprints per milestone post launch and content update. Uh, but, but what you're seeing over here on the, the left is uh, basically, I guess what you call a feature set. They happen to be champions because our uh, Megalith had characters. So we had champion four, champion five. Uh, we broke this down by, um, by individual. Uh, and this is basically all the artists. Matthew's a concept artist. Ali is a character model. Carolina was our animator. Patrick's a VFX. And we're missing one. I don't see him in here. But um, so in order for Carolina, right, if you look here, in order for Carolina to start the white box rig, she needed Ali's pass on whatever champion five to be, you know, wherever here. Like, don't, don't look at whether this is actually accurate or not, because it's probably not. It's completely broken. But let, let's say that um, she, he was supposed to be done uh, by here for her to start, right? So if I come to him on this Thursday or this Wednesday, and I say, hey, how are we looking for Friday or Monday? And he says, uh, I don't know. I don't think I'm going to make it. I might go a day or two over, right? That's going to shift everything, not, not just his task, but Carolina's dependent. She's got a dependency on this task. Um, so that needs to be called out early. Um, and then so basically this would be discussed in a morning scrum stand-up. Say, all right, Ali's going to push until Monday. How does that affect you, Carolina? Is there anything you can do to prep for that or whatever? If not, then a decision has to be made to whether cut cut this model where it's at and just say it's good good enough, which happens, um, or, you know, 
move her to something else. Uh, but, but this is constantly shifting and, um, uh, it, this is basically the producer's job to constantly watch this type of stuff. Now we have now, um, integrated into our JIRA system, a roadmap software into Confluence. So it stays living and accurate based on estimates and the tasks before I would have to come in here and manually update something or, or whatever. Um, so, uh, that became really difficult with any sort of shifting schedule or shifting uh, priority on something or somebody going over estimate and everything needs to be pushed and shift and you keep pushing out and out and out. Eventually you have to make really hard decisions about what to cut and what, what can be cut. Usually that's at the director level. So a uh, producer's gonna go to the director and say, we've got a problem. You know, Ollie's not gonna hit this. If he doesn't hit this by Monday, which it doesn't sound like he will, we're, it's not gonna make content update number one. Um, so we either need to cut it completely or push or pull things around or cut different features, whatever. Prioritize what's most important. Um, and that's the really, really hard decisions that you have to make in game development is what to cut. Looking back at Megalith, um, there, it's just painful oftentimes to look at that game and know what it could have been, but we had so many production problems and issues, and most of that surrounded the uh, difficulties around VR and the unknowns around VR. Um, but, uh, yeah, we're, we're definitely uh, not blinded to the fact that um, hard decisions had to be made and things were cut um, quite late in production, too. That's the other thing is you never want, like, you need to cut that stuff off as early as you can. If, you, if you're looking at a schedule and it looks like it's too much, it's way too much. If you're looking at a schedule and it looks like, uh, I don't think we can make this, you're not gonna make it. Um, if it looks like, uh, I think this is doable or I don't think we have enough, you'll barely make it. That's pretty, pretty typical. <laughs> so uh, in my experience anyway. Um, if I could go back a little, just scrolling up the questions that were posed in chat. Um, a really simple one was asked about what your typical day looks like. Yeah. So, uh, again, let me know if I'm talking too much or going over. I don't want to hold anyone up, but, uh, so typical morning, um, this happens with Activision, um, as well. We do a morning scrum. So the morning scrum is typically the whole team gets together and we go over the previous day's tasks any concerns or questions or uh, you know any call outs that anybody may have and then each person talks a bit about what they're working on um, and the reason for that is uh, twofold it's it's not only for the production side to understand where we're at in the schedule and, and listen for any problems it also allows for some cross-pollination so when the designer or the artist this happens more often the artist will say oh, I'm working on this really cool VFX, it's in Niagara, and we're gonna use like, this, it looks beautiful, and there's 10,000, uh, this particle emitter, has, you know, there's 10,000 particle emitters, and it's the, and the engineer might be like, oh my God, we can't do that, you know, but he, he may not, or she may not have heard that before um, with the daily standup, but we'll do a daily standup, uh, and any, any discussion that goes, any in down into any rabbit hole or, or prolongs more than like 30 seconds to a minute we'll table it and say we'll, we'll, we'll discuss after the meeting and you just kind of keep that quick uh, because you can definitely get into death by meeting uh, we've definitely worked with large publishers I don't want to call any of them out but they there it's definitely death by meeting all day long meetings um, and so we're we're really um, aware of that and we try not to do that and then basically so a lot of this has changed with remote work uh, but and then basically we would all you know go back um, and start doing our work for the day oftentimes and then you have lunch our structure is pretty much like you can come and go as you please um, and then there's typically afternoon meetings um, maybe not for every discipline um, and, and then some more work and then, uh, that's basically it. So we try to keep it to one stand up. Maybe there's some one or two, usually one weekly scheduled meeting for each discipline or each group, uh, art meeting once a week. The programmers here do, um, 
a programmer meeting once a week, but then every other week we have what's called a beer and learn. The programmers do it. They started it. Um, the artists do it as well. But one of the, the programmers will get up and talk about something they learned. They'll give a presentation basically, and we supply beer and snacks or water, if that's your thing. Um, and, th you know, they learn about, I don't know, optimizing shaders and unreal, whatever, something, some engineering stuff you guys would be excited about, I'm sure. But, um, uh, that's pretty typical. Our hours are 10 to 6, 30, uh, usually around there. Um, we, so this is a, a big point um, as well. You've got to really, really watch out for burnout. Um, burnout, super common in this industry, super common. I've seen it. I've seen it over and over and over. People, you can come in and work yourself to death in a uh, in a game dev in a studio easily. They'll let you do it. Most studios will let you do it. Um, and so you need to be really aware of that. We have like a pretty strict no overtime policy. And that's not because we don't want to pay overtime. That's because we don't want to burn our employees out. We save those like real critical, like, hey, we need to work over the weekend for like once a year, maybe. Um, in the two years that we worked on Megalith, I can recall three times that we worked on a weekend day. Um, um, and I recall one night sleeping on the couch uh, in the game room, but that was because we had some VRC submission stuff to Japan and we were waiting and it was odd hours and I was up and with another engineer. But other than that, um, you know, you will be in an environment where you're able to work yourself to death if you want to. Um, so please, please don't do that. You know, um, take care of yourselves. This is a, um, a physically demanding job, believe it or not, you're sitting all day long, you're staring at a screen, um, and uh, be sure to take rests, be sure to take time off, and you know, don't, don't hold on to everything so personally, and it's hard not to, because you get assigned tasks, and you might be in charge of a feature, and it's like, oh, uh, if I don't do this, 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 and this, or him, her, and her won't, won't you know, you just kind of have to let it go um, every now and then. And the only reason I'm stressing this is because I've seen it a lot. I've seen it a lot, a lot. Um, and be aware to look out for those signs in yourself once you do start working in this industry um, to make sure you take care of yourself. So um, I know we're kind of going close to over the 30 minute mark. And I know we agreed for your time's sake, you know, that it would be around 30 minutes. Um, I do see a few questions I do really want to answer if that's okay with you. Yeah, Maybe sure. we just go for like uh, the cutoff point of like 7.45. That's sure. Cool. sure. Um, so on top of the whole idea of burnout, um, Raf asked in chat, like, what do you think is important to keep a team motivated and excited about working on a project apart from like the project itself? Or how do you maintain like high morales in your team? Yeah, we do a few things. Um, feature ownership. Um, and so what I mean by that is we really try to let people work on the things that they're excited to do. Um, we can't always do that, but if we have a new project and we know there's this feature, this feature, and this feature, you know, who we know Kevin is really interested in uh, graphics and optimization. We know Carolina is super interested in VFX. Um, and even though they may not be the best person uh for that role or, or the most knowledgeable we'll we'll still let them do that because um uh tribal knowledge and stuff is super important as well and, and we want that cross-pollination and teams to learn stuff um and we also like i said we do the beer and learns and we do a lot of like social stuff like, like i mean you can tell you know i'm whatever 37 uh i wear a backwards hat and a north face sweatshirt to work and, uh, you know, we have uh, artists that take their shoes off uh, in the office. Some people don't wear shoes at all. Some people don't speak on Tuesdays. Like, it's this really strange, eclectic group. But that's kind of like what makes this um, industry so exciting, you know, is there's these really interesting, super smart, super talented, but really unique people. Um, and uh, it's okay to, like, you know, like we just sent out a little box um, 
a little snack box to the team we're working remote. I sent it out and it was like, you know, little treats that we would have normally had in the office, uh, but we're all working remote, so it's a bit weird now. But um, it's a hard thing to do, but it's also, that is another thing the producer needs to watch out for. Watch out for burnout. Watch out for, you know, how people act and, and react and, and make sure everyone's doing okay and just kind of checking in on people and talking. And um, But normally it's feature ownership and excitement about uh, the product we're working on. We have a really flat structure, so we let everybody have input on what we're working on. We're very open about the projects that we have potential to work on, and we let people have input and buy-in. And so that's kind of how we do it uh, at, at Disruptive. Okay. Um, I think we have time for maybe one, two questions, um, but more of a closing question. Um, how do you deal with um, new people joining a project or maybe leaving early to work on something else or other kind of stuff of that variety? Yeah, so we haven't had, uh, knock on wood, an issue with people leaving early um, at Disruptive or leaving Disruptive in general. I think in the five years I've been here, we've only had one person leave and he went to Bungie. Uh, uh, and a big part of that's the culture and, and the environment um, that we have at Disruptive. But um, there's definitely opportunities. So the hard part for us, is picking the right opportunity and the right project that we want to do that's a really really hard thing to do and that's another part about that open structure i was talking about we kind of let the team know and and we have buy on and feedback from them ultimately it's the ceo and the director's decisions um, but we all have a say which makes it feel really good um, but uh yeah we kind of let i guess the answer is we kind of let people gravitate towards what they want to if we're able to um, and we always know that and we keep that in mind and we look for projects that are going to benefit our team as a whole, where we're looking to go and what we're, what we're wanting to do and where we want to build our knowledge. Um, not sure if I answered that question, but. Yeah. Um, and then I think the other part was like for new add-ons, how to um, let them assimilate into the group and not step on toes and get, you know, adjusted. Yeah. That's a soup. That is the most difficult aspect of remote work right now for sure. Um, we have a pretty strong studio culture. And before, you know, when a, a new hire would come in, maybe, she, you know, we have an open floor. So she might be, you know, right there in the center with all of us and she can hear all the discussions and kind of get a sense for the culture and all that. Uh, when you're re working remote, it's just this, maybe this discord server some people might be on webcam, but you have to like push this button and say, oh, hi, you know, it's, it's kind of weird. Um, so that's really, really hard to do. Um, but bef previous to COVID, um, you know, like I said, it's an open floor structure. So, th and that was done on purpose and um, directors, CEOs, and the interns all sit in the same floor in the same area. There's no like, oh, the go talk to the CEO in their office. We're just all right there together. Um, and sometimes culture fits aren't, you know, perfect and that's okay. Um, the common thread though is if you have a love for games and you're super passionate about video games, you're going to fit in just fine. Like um, there's a lot of robust debates about game mechanics and, whether the last of us two ended properly or whatever it was uh, there's always some crazy you know <laughs> discussion and arguments about that um but always uh you know it, that's a hard thing right now with remote work for sure the hardest okay i think we're just about to wrap up then um it's definitely been a pleasure having you um talk to and let us you know how it is in the industry yeah. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, um, I think, you know, if, if anybody ever has follow up questions or, or would like to speak to, um, you know, I'm not an engineer. Um, uh, but, you know, I, our, our studio has some really great people that are super open and, and willing to help others. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, we'd be more than happy to answer questions if we can. We, we're often pretty busy, but, um, you know, feel free to reach out to me. 
on LinkedIn or whatever it is and just shoot me a question and I'd be more than happy to answer it or give you guidance on something. Um, because like I said, I do, I think I do look at a lot of applications and a, and a lot of um, people coming right out of school and I can give you some really good tips on like do's and don'ts there. Um, a big one, the big one, really last thing, if you're sending out a, a, a application or your resume to somewhere, I would highly recommend like creating an email that's like some really professional, like first dot last name at whatever, but like make sure that your profile image in your email isn't like, you know, you with your shirt off and your abs or whatever, like it just is like really strange. We get that a lot. Um, and you know, but, uh, yeah, just try it in it, you know, don't be like vape 420 all day dot, you know, at gmail.com or something like that. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, other than that, I think you'll be fine. You have a passion and, and last thing you don't, your resume or it's not always about what's on your resume. If you can attach a project that you've worked on, like you say, I built this from, you know, scratch and here's my little game. I don't care if it looks like shit. If, if it's a game that you've built and I can jump on and play it, that is huge because that tells me you know you know everything you need to, to take a, 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 a pro something from prototype or concept to, to building it and outputting an exe and I can play it. That's huge, big big deal. So if you can do something like that that you can add, like here's my you know whatever a clip or a video of it, that's that's a big big thing too. So uh, yeah. All right, so we are at the 7.45 mark. Uh, so I'd like to thank Grant for showing up. Um, it's been a pleasure. I think I've learned personally a lot and um, I hope you don't mind if I ask you questions on what, like is LinkedIn, is LinkedIn the best? Way yeah, you, you? LinkedIn's, LinkedIn's fine. You can also reach me at uh, grant.rogers at disruptivegames.com. Um, like I said, I'm a bit busy. I, I I may see your email and I'm not, I won't delete it or remove it, but it might take me a few days to get back to you, but I will get back to you. Um, um, and I'd be more than happy to answer questions like that. Um, I think it's, it's really helpful and it's so hard to find information like this. Um, so this is really good that you guys do this and I hope you guys get some speakers that are way better than me and way more knowledgeable than me, but uh, yeah. All right, thank you so much, Grant. Thank you. Um, Okay. I'm going to say that we can end it here. Um, for Game Dev members, we still do have like an activity for you guys, like in the Discord at least. Um, but with that, I think we can end it. Is that cool? All right, sweet. All right, thank you. All right. You guys have thank a good Thank you so weekend. much, Grant. Yeah. 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 having you here. I, I sent you a connection <laughs> request. <laughs> okay, good, good, do it. No problem. <laughs> All, All right. right. Stay bye -bye. safe out there, guys. Peace. Bye-bye. <laughs>